Well, good morning, Christ Chapel. It is a pleasure to be with you, and good morning to those of you who are on different venues and online around the kitchen table, perhaps in your living room. It's a pleasure to open up God's Word with you this morning. What a blessing to do that. So turn to the Scriptures, to the book of Jonah, Jonah chapter 3. Jonah 3, page 775 in the Pew Bible if you need that. And Jonah's one of those books that's a little tough to find. It's tucked into those desolate places of your Bible that you rarely go to. And so I'm going to give you a little while to find that. But please lend me your ears as I, as I give you a little update on where we're at as we head to chapter 3. If you've been with us for a few weeks... You'll have heard us in chapter 1 and chapter 2 really talk about what I'm about to review. The first is that the book is fascinating. I mean, it kicks off with the irony of a, an ungodly man of God, a defiant preacher, right, who uh, goes on the run from God uh, on a ship and is very, very comfortable in his disobedience. In fact, he takes a nap and he's snoring his head off while God sends a brutal storm to get his attention. Scary thought that, that you can be completely at ease outside of God's will for your life. So he's comfortable with that for a while, uh, and the pagan sailors that are working hard to rescue the ship, including Jonah, come to him, and they ask him, who, who is it that you are? Who are you? And his lips tell them, that he's a worshiper of God, but his life clearly begs to differ. His lips tell them, I, I worship God, but, but clearly his life is in contradiction with that. And, and Monday to Saturday life is much more expressive of what you believe than Sunday morning singing. It's always been the case. It still is the case. Now, God won't let his rebellious servant, his defiant preacher off the hook. He's like a spoiled child, and we all deal with spoiled children in an appropriate way. So hot on the heels of a, of a, of a great storm, God sends a great gobbling fish, gobbles him up. And it's a very unconventional mode of deliverance, but, but it is deliverance. God is delivering Jonah from Jonah. Uh, the uh, chapter two, uh, you'll find Jonah uh, in this moment of reflection and penning this beautiful love poem to God that says, you are great and you are kind and you're a God who rescues those who cling to you from the belly of a fish. It's, it's fascinating. God has him on a timeout because God is disciplining him because God loves him. And Jonah seems to be getting the message. Now, the fish, unlike Jonah, does obey God and gobbles Jonah up, and then he deposits him on a nearby beach, uh, and Jonah is now ready to, to go to Nineveh, chapter 3, where we pick up. So hopefully that's enough time for you to find Jonah. If not, your sermon notes have the text there, and the screens will also, so you can look on, on there as well. As I said, a fascinating book tucked in there in, in the Scriptures. It's, it's no wonder that the, the Jonah story is one of the all-time favorite Bible stories for young and old, historically speaking, especially the kids. And I mean, uh, bedtime Bible stories have made a lot of money by using the Jonah story to help you. Uh, get your kids to sleep at night. I mean, it leaves them wide-eyed. Like little kitty. Little kitty uh, was in second grade, and she uh, was doing her show and tell at school, and, and she got up and she brought up uh, her little Jonah and the fish story. She proceeded to tell the class about how Jonah was swallowed up by this fish, and the teacher, who's a skeptic and didn't believe the Bible, put up with it. But when little Katie sat down, uh, the teacher said, well, now, children, this is all make-believe. It's a wonderful little story, Katie, but it's all make-believe. We all know that fish don't swallow up human beings and that they survive. Well, that put little Katie out a little bit. 
So she took her teacher on and, and she insisted, no, 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 uh, miss, the Bible says that Jonah was swallowed up by a fish. And this went back and forth for a little while and, and they were both getting very frustrated until Katie said this, well, miss, when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask him. The teacher, again, irritated all the more at the concept of a heaven, uh, said to her, well, what if Jonah didn't get to heaven? What if he went to that other little fiery place in your Bible called hell? Little Kitty, without missing a beat, said, well, then I guess you can ask him. <laughs> <laughs> I had to slip my only Jonah joke in today, and there it is. It's, it's good, little Kitty. It's, it's a great story. You have a great storm and you have a great fish. And once we get to chapter three, you have a great revival. A great spiritual awakening where masses of people are coming to God to seek his salvation. It's, it's, it's a beautiful story. What is involved in a great revival? What would, what would be the components to that? What would it look like? to experience that. It's been a fascinating week for me as I've studied this passage and I grew up reading about revivals. I grew up uh, listening to stories about great revivals, particularly in my motherland, Northern Ireland. Back then it was known as Ulster, the Ulster Revivals. I've tormented my wife all week as I've read other books on the Ulster Revival, chasing her around the house going, listen to this story, listen to this story, listen to this story. She's kind of said, I, I love your stories, but I've got four kids to go and find and feed somewhere. Leave me alone. It's been fascinating. Stories such as the old drunkard of Brock Shane. Brock Shane is a little village in Northern Ireland. The old drunkard of Brock Shane who, who stood up in a public gathering and he defied the audience there. He says, find me a person who has been more defiant of God in the last 40 years in, in this town than I. You all know me as the profligate, the sinner, the drunkard of Brock Shane. For 50 years, I have led my family to beggary to poverty because of my drinking and my sinful habits. But, and here's what he says, I was a servant of the devil, but aha, gentlemen, I have seen Jesus. I was born again last week, and I am one week old. My heavy and enormous sin is gone. The Lord Jesus took it. The drunkard of Brock Shane, or the little Catholic boy from Ballymena. You're getting a little tour of Northern Ireland. Ballymena. His priest and his parents, who were Roman Catholics, said, you're not going to those Protestant meetings. But he had this inner desire to know Jesus. So he went, and he came home, and he got a beating for it. And he scraped a little bit of money together, and he went out, and he bought himself a New Testament. Problem is, he couldn't read. So he found an old, old man down the street, and the condition was, I will give you this New Testament if I can come and you read it to me. And he did. And he found the Lord Jesus Christ. His life changed. In the 1900s, there was a, an evangelist in my home city, Belfast, called William Nicholson. N uh, William Nicholson preached the gospel and thousands came to faith in Jesus Christ. In the shipbuilding area, which is where the Titanic was built, thousands came to Christ, so much so that the company had to build a shed, a massive warehouse. They called it the Nicholson Shed. And it wasn't so that these uh, believers could gather, it's so that they could store all the returned tools that these now converted shipbuilders were returning because of the conviction of the Holy Spirit in their hearts. Didn't know what to do with them. They, they actually said, stop bringing back the stuff you stole. We've nowhere to put it. Such was the revival in the early 1900s where I come from. In some churches, it's reported that they were so packed that people had to, to sit in the aisles and on the steps and on the platform and on the windowsills that balconies began to tilt and had to be reinforced that preachers couldn't get to the pulpit because of the masses of people flocking to hear God, to hear what God had to say, to, to, 
to know Jesus. In fact, in one church, it was reported that there were so many people packed in there that the cumulative human heat that rose up hit the cold air in a winter night, condensed and rained upon them inside the church building, like a natural, somewhat yucky sprinkler system, long before there were sprinkler systems. Why am I telling you all this? Because uh, at the risk of sounding a little bit of a, a little emotionally fragile, I've been kind of weepy all week as I have delighted in reading these stories of God's Spirit being poured out on masses of people and desiring that he would do it again. Lord, do it again in my generation, in your your generation. Pour out your spirit in such a way that, that you will one day see America unapologetically worshiping Jesus. Don't you long for that? I long for that. Here, I long for that in my motherland. Venues packed to the rafters, giving Pastor Cody a headache as to where he's going to put you all because you want to hear from God. Listen, God wants America back. God wants America back. This can happen. God longs for it to happen, and we have a God-given, delegated role in that pursuit. God wants us involved so let's, let's walk through Jonah 3 and, and, and see what emerges and, and peer into a great city revival uh, back then in the city of Nineveh. Look at verses 1 to 3. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. So this is round two. Saying, arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I, God, tell you. So Jonah arose, and he went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. So a few things to note there. The storm obeys, the fish obeys, and now finally Jonah obeys. And obedience uh, opens up wonderful opportunities. It really does, and it does here for Jonah to get back on board with God's plan for Jonah and for Nineveh. He gets another chance, and and at some point, go home and read chapter 1, verses 1 to 3, and and you'll see that it is a direct parallel in chapter 3, verses 1 to 3. It's it's the same instructions that Jonah gets, literarily being set up so that Jonah and anybody who would read it understands that Jonah is put into the same spot. It's the same deal. It's the same arrangement. And I'm sure Jonah connected the dots. Okay, I'm back on land. I'm instructed in exactly the same capacity, but now I smell a fish. And so I know what to do and what not to do. God disciplined Jonah. He didn't destroy Jonah. He disciplined Jonah because he loves Jonah. God loves Jonah and God restores him. He's back on land and God recommissions him. He's back on mission for God and Jonah's now off his time out, but not to do whatever Jonah wants, to do what God wants. It's like when I put my children on a time out and they get up from the time out, I don't say, I, I, I now go and do whatever you want. It's no, let's go right back to where we were that got you there in the first place. Jonah is loved by God. He gets a second chance. All of us get a second chance. The drunkard of Brock Shane got a second chance. You can get a second chance, but only if you turn to him. And Jonah did in chapter two, in the belly of the fish, where he penned this beautiful poem. God is kind. Think about that for a second. God is kind. God is kind. Don't get over that, ever. God's loving kindness is a remarkable characteristic of him, and he's kind towards Jonah. He is concerned about his worker just as much as his work, his man, as much as his mission. God's concerned for Jonah, and he restores him. Now, I'm sure that Jonah never got over the consequences of his discipline. So there are consequences to failure and to, and, and to making mistakes and to rebelling. 
It doesn't mean you live in guilt in those consequences if you've been restored, but, but, but they're perhaps present on a daily basis. Some would actually say that Jonah's skin was bleached white by the gastric juices of the fish, which is why in Matthew, when Jesus refers to the sign of Jonah, that he's referring to the fact that the message Jonah preached was accompanied by a physical manifestation of what had happened to Jonah. There are consequences. You don't have to live in the consequences. Listen, I'm sure that Jonah never went for a swim in the sea ever again, right? Or never ordered fish at Papados. It's like, I, I, there, there's consequences to what I did. I'm not going back there. God is willing. God is willing to break us, to restore us, to discipline us because we're deviant and to get us back on track with his plans for our lives and for the lives of those that he wants to reach through us. When God restores, his servants obey. That's essentially what I'm saying. That's what we see here in the first few verses, that when God restores his deviant disciple, that deviant disciple is restored so that he or she obeys. And, and, and Jonah does that. He arises and he goes. He heads off to Nineveh. Let's, let's read verses three at the end of three and four to see what happens. Now, Nineveh was an exceedingly great city. Three days journey in breadth. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey. And he called out, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. A short Message given to him by God, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Now, it says several times in chapter 3 and also in chapter 1 and in chapter 4 that Nineveh is a great city. What does that mean? Well, we know that it was militarily powerful. Uh, we know that economically it was powerful. I mean, Nineveh is the USA of its day. No doubt about it. The, the, the military strength, the e economic strength of, of its uh, era. It was also great at sin. Pick your sin. The Ninevites uh, engaged it. This is a city nation. It's the capital of a broader uh, area, the Assyrian kingdom, that, that were brilliant, if I could use that term as it, as it relates to doing everything that God doesn't want them to do. Brutally violent, brutally immoral. This is, this is kind of the, the, the society that results when Satan has his grip on a people. Uh, go to the British Museum in London. It's free. Not, not the trip isn't free to London. The museum's free to get into. And you go into the Assyrian section and you can walk down corridors of murals. You know what murals are? It's like big walls with depictions, scenes that are being used as propaganda. We have Assyrian propaganda. And you can walk right down and see all the stuff that they got up to. Horrible. Absolutely horrible. So when God refers to Nineveh as a great city, He's not talking about their military strength, like, wow, they have got really sharp swords. And he's not talking about their economic strength, like they're, they're really good business people. What does great mean on the lips of God as he refers to this city? It means that it's packed with what he values most, people. It's one of the largest cities in the world at that time. It's filled with people, and God loves people. God values people. It is a great city, Jonah, and they're lost. They're lost. In chapter 4, you're going to read that they don't know their right hand from their left hand as it, as it relates to morality. They're in Satan's grip. So Jonah walks on in there. That takes some guts. We believe that those murals that uh, are now in London, they were sort of plundered by the British Empire when they ruled that part of the world and brought that. We believe that they probably would have lined the entryways to cities like Nineveh. So that as you entered in there, you were well aware of where you were entering. And Jonah walks on into Nineveh. 
And, and he's probably thinking, boy, that's, that's what's going to happen to me just now. I mean, I'm not going back to the beach, but I'm probably going to be skinned alive. And he goes up to his first street corner, and he says, yet 40 days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. I, I'm assuming he whispered it the first time. You know, just, Lord, I'm doing it. Yeah, 40 days, and Nineveh's going to be. I mean, I've got to get in here three days, and I've got to get out of here. It's a straight-cut announcement of God's judgment that's coming out of Jonah's mouth. But but make no mistake about it, implied in the message is an invitation to repent. It's a conditional decree of God, we call it. He's giving them 40 days to do something with the information that they've just received. When God's servants obey, God's word is proclaimed. That's what emerges here. When God's restored servant obeys, that restored and obedient servant proceeds to deliver the message that God has placed upon him or her. When God's servants obey, God's word is proclaimed. And and Jonah is delivering God's message. Verse 2, the message that I tell you to deliver. Let's look at what happens, verses 5 and on. The people of Nineveh, believed. The people of Nineveh believed. This is remarkable. Verse 5 is kind of a general description of what happened. Verses 6 and on is more specific description of what happened. They believed. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. What's that you're saying at the street corner? What's going to happen? Speak up, prophet. What? They believed. They responded to the message, top to bottom. This is, my friends, this is every preacher's dream, (laughs) right? That those who are, are spiritually snoring, no offense, it's a hypothetical example, wake up. And listen to what's being preached and and leave these doors and do something about it. That they respond to God's message. Every preacher's dream. And so we have a spiritual awakening in the most vile of places that deserves judgment. They turn to God in the droves from king to pauper. Look at verse 6. The word reached the king of Nineveh. And he rose from his throne, he removed his robe, he covered himself with sackcloth, and he sat in ashes. Now, all of that is kind of weird stuff to us, but to them, that meant, I am showing you that I am turning from my wicked ways. I'm positioning myself to express regret and remorse and repentance. Sackcloth is uncomfortable to wear, then and today. You've all raced in those sackcloth races and sports days. I don't know if you do that in this country. They do it in my country. That's rough material. Sitting in ashes is an expression of distress. Fasting is a way of saying, I am dependent upon someone else. I'm needy. The king repents. And look, he issues a decree, verse 7 and on. It's, it's kind of his newsflash that goes out through their version of Twitter, right? And he issued a proclamation and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles. Let, ever, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. And let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger, literally his flared nostrils, so that we may not perish. This pagan king understands through the message that if he and they turn, God might turn. He doesn't know about the kindness of God, but he's plunging himself into his arms, hoping that he is a kind God. Jonah knows he's a kind God. 
So basically what we have here is the king making sure that everybody does it. And to show the extent, they're even going to get their little donkeys and their chihuahua dogs, right, to fast and, and have ashes sprinkled on them. Like, let's, let's just really show God that we're turning to him. It's remarkable. It's beautiful. When God's servant is restored, he obeys. When a servant is obedient, proclaims, he proclaims God's word. And when God's word is proclaimed, a nation repents. That's what's happening here. A nation repents because of the proclamation of the word of God through a restored, obedient servant of God. A nation can't repent if they don't know God. America can't repent if it doesn't know God. It can't, who are they going to turn back to if we're not proclaiming who he is and what he's like and what he's done and what he will do? I love verse two. Tell them the message that I will tell to you. And then I love verse five. And the people of Nineveh believed God. I have sat in that verse for days. The people of Nineveh believed in God. Look at verse 10, look at what God does. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented. God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them and he did not do it. God watched. God watched for a response to the preaching of his word and God saw what they did and because of what they did, God changed his mind. And God's allowed to do that, especially if, decreed, if he's decreed something conditionally. If this is going to happen, implied, if you respond, well, I will not do that. That's what occurs here. The word relents is beautiful. It, it, it has connotations of compassion. God took compassion on them because he's kind. God is kind. What did he see? Well, he, see, he saw what they did. Don't miss that. Underline that. He saw what they did. They repented. They showed him. He saw how they turned. He saw how they turned. They were active in their turning. It was visible. Uh, belief is ultimately evident in your behavior. This is, this is what Jonah was learning in chapters 1 and 2. I can talk all day about my love for God, but if my life doesn't change, I don't really believe that. Their behavior expressed their belief. When a nation repents, truly turns to God, God relents. God turns. He responds with compassion. He averts his judgment. He is willing to forgive. That's why he is adamant that Jonah get to Nineveh. I want to forgive them. I want to show my kindness to them. That's a wonderful story, isn't it? That's a fantastic. This is the greatest revival recorded in the pages of Scripture. Now, here's what I want you to take home with you. What, what would be involved in another great awakening? Think about that. What would be involved in a work of God like that today, a great revival? Well, we, you know, we don't have a formula that guarantees revival will come. We can't conjure that up. But, but here's a few things that pop out of that that I want you to go home with. Number one, and don't ever forget this, the revival of a nation is of God. The revival of a nation is of God. That's, it's God's doing. Don't miss that. God is the one who saves He's the one who called Jonah. He's the one who went after Jonah. He's the one who sent the storm. He's the one who sent the, the, the fish. He's the one who sent the, ship, the fish back to the beach. He's the one who recalled Jonah. He's the one who sent them to Nineveh. He's the one who saved Nineveh. God is the active agent in this great book and in this great revival. God's the one who saves. In our historical moment where we live, we know that that's through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We, we know that. You know that, that God saves through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But what I want you to understand is that God wants to save. Chapter 3 is telling us loud and clear, God desires to save. God desires that the Ninevites come to him, that, that, 
That's what he longs for. His plan is a plan of salvation. God is kind. He wants to to save. He's not uncaring. He's not detached. He's not distant. He wants this place to be a place that is so packed out that I can barely get to the pulpit where we have to reinforce the balconies or whatever venue you're in where you have to squeeze up a little bit to fit the people in because God wants to save. He wants to save them. Perhaps experience some sort of remarkable uh, sprinkler system indoors for us as well. That would be a wonderful story. I don't know what it would look like, but it would be a wonderful story to be able to pass on to the next generation. You know what God did in our day? He can do it in your day. God's the one who saves and he wants to save. Rich, poor, man, woman, tall, small, skinny, not so skinny, the vilest of nations on the planet. The old drunkard of brunk shame. Me, you. Turn to God and he will turn to you. So we can't fabricate, we can't conjure up a revival. Revival is of God, but he has chosen to give us some delegated responsibilities. Don't miss that. We have a responsibility. God chooses to operate through Jonah. God chooses to operate through the preaching of his word. God chooses to operate through you and through me. The revival of a nation involves you. It involves you. The revival of a nation involves us. It involves me. I love what that pastor, William Nicholson, remember the Nicholson shed that was built? He used to say this, it is the Holy Spirit who convicts, but he allows us to rub him in. I love that. It's the Holy Spirit who convicts, but we get to rub the Holy Spirit into society, into the lives of people. God wants you Involved. Listen, we're at that time in the sermon where I need to wake you up. So go ahead and poke the person beside you and tell him, God wants you. Poke, poke away. If he's asleep, flick. God wants you. There we go. God wants you involved. That's the, the, the Baptist past of mine coming out. Why God chooses within his sovereignty to involve me and you is a mystery. But Matthew 28 and the Great Commission makes it very, very clear that we have to go. Same word, go. We have to arise and go and make disciples to the ends of the earth. God doesn't use those who are in disobedience, but Jonah chapter one type believers. Jonah's on the run, snoring in disobedience. He restores disobedient believers so that he can use them. You know, there's a wonderful passage in 2 Chronicles 7. And it says this, if my people who are called by my name, that's us, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their own wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive. That's a remarkable verse. God is eager to save and by his design, he involves you, but not you in rebellion, you restored. You need to get back with God if you want God to do something in America. Revival of this nation begins with you in prayer. Listen to what another well-known evangelist in my homeland said some years ago when asked about the secret of his evangelistic success. A pastor came and said, well, what is it you do that, that seems to bring so many to Christ? And he was like, it's, it's not what I do, it's what God does, but, but here's a start for you. He says, brother, go home. Lock yourself in a room. Take a piece of chalk and draw a circle on the floor. Then get inside the circle on your knees. Confess your known sins and determine in your heart that you're going to follow Jesus, whatever the call and whatever the cost, and ask him to begin that work of revival in you. And when he does this, My friend, you have the beginning of a revival in your church and in your city and in your land. The revival of a nation involves you. It involves us. It begins with a revived church, a church which is back on track with God. And you don't want to be the block 
or the blockage in what God is going to do in America. Lastly, the revival of a nation involves repentance, giving the preaching of truth. The, the revival of a nation involves repentance. You can't get back to God any other way than repenting, believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. But that comes through the proclamation of truth, and truth is under assault, aggressive assault. You know, in, it, it, it's been Satan's tactic from the beginning. Genesis 3, remember, when, when the serpent basically begins this conversation with, with Eve, he says this, did God really say it's that challenge on God's truth, what God has said. That, that's the tactic he's still, but today it's become, it's morphed into a very, very dangerous version. If, if I could project that Genesis 3 into today's age, what Satan would be saying to the woman is, ah, yeah, that's kind of God's truth, but, but Eve, you can make up your own truth. Like you can give him his truth and you can build your own truth and then you're both happy. That's where we're at today. Truth is under assault. 74%, this is according to Barna Research, which is very reliable research, 74% of 35-year-olds and under believe what is right for you or works best for you is your truth. It's, it makes mockery of that verse too. Go to Nineveh and tell them what I tell you. No, no, it's I'm gonna go to Nineveh and I'm gonna tell them what they wanna hear. Because they have their truth, I have my truth, God, you have your truth. That's, that's crazy stuff. When you study revivals as well, you know, there are some common denominators. One of them is the preaching of the word of God according to central doctrines like, number one, sin. Number two, judgment coming. Number three, but there is a savior. Number four, turn, repent. All of them highly offensive today. You, you, you call something sin and you're, you're getting sued. You've got to proclaim the word of God. God's truth uh, comes to us through his word. We need to gather around this pulpit. We need to protect this pulpit. We need to feast uh, in God's word in this pulpit. Uh, historically speaking, the Holy Spirit's Choice scalpel for spiritual heart restoration is the word of God. God wants to revive. So Jonah is about a great story. It is a fantastic story. It's got a great storm. It's got a great fish. It's got a great revival. And chapter four, you're gonna see that because it's penned by a great God, a kind God who loves God, wants America back. That's not gonna happen unless there's repentance beginning in here, beginning in here. And God wants you back, you singular. Perhaps you're here this morning and you've been coming to church for years, but you have never personally come to God. Recognize sin, recognize that you're under his judgment, have never met him as your savior, haven't been restored to him. I have a simple message for you. Jonah's message was just five words in the Hebrew version, just five words. Uh, I have a simple message for you. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved because God is kind. God wants you here, just like the drunkard of Brock Shane and the little Catholic boy from Balamina came to God. God wants you. He's kind. He's loving. I'm happy to introduce you. I will be here at the end of the service, as will others. Come and talk to me. Come and talk to us. Don't leave this place under conviction without having it been resolved. If God can save Nineveh, he can certainly save you. And he wants to. Father, we thank you for what we read in Jonah 3. That you are kind and that you're willing to be patient with a vile nation because you love people. Help us to be revived within our souls and to go into the world and tell other people about Jesus Christ. I pray that your spirit would be poured down and that masses 
tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands would come to a relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen.